David got their athletic and particularly gymnastic skill. They got it from me. I know that because one day I woke up and mine was all gone. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, please. We were talking about, for the last number of weeks, a man named Gideon and how God, the process God took Gideon and really everybody uh, to, through in order to accomplish his purposes. We, we make a lot of grace around here because God makes a lot of grace. And the word grace in the uh, New Te- language of the New Testament and the, the Hebrew of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New Testament, incredibly descriptive languages. And uh, English often oversimplifies complex and sometimes multifaceted things. And the word grace, charis, in the, in the Greek actually means God's influence on our heart and how it's revealed through our lives. So God starts with working on our hearts, but he doesn't want to end there. He wants to shape our lives and our attitudes so that what God is doing inside of us, he can do through us to start that process or accomplish that purposes in the lives of others. Satan, on the other hand, is busy in the, in, the, in the process of trying to frustrate God's purposes or literally frustrate the grace of God. The Bible speaks many ways uh, to describe uh, Satan. He is a master at deceit and mischief. God describes him as a thief in John 10.10, 10, as a murderer in John 8.44, as an accuser in Zechariah. And if I won't have the time to go into all of these, but that's one of the reasons why we provide notes. So you can go home and look at your Bible and see for yourself whether the things I'm telling you are actually true. An angel of light, which means he's a master at disguising himself and convincing us that we're actually following God, when in many cases we're following him. He's also called the deceiver, hoparasmos in the Greek, the deceiver, the destroyer in John 10, 1 Corinthians 10, 10, also called Apollyon, which in the Greek means destroyer in the book of Revelation. He's called the tempter in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, when he came to Jesus. He's called the serpent in Genesis and 2 Corinthians in the book of Revelation. He's described as a roaring lion who walks about seeking whom he can devour in 1 Peter 5, 8. Jesus called him the prince of this world. That talks a lot about the influence he has in this world. And the Apostle Paul actually described him as the God of this world. Little g, but nevertheless a great deal of influence. Last week we looked at how Satan was able to take Gideon, whom Gideon, God had shaped and worked in Gideon's life to accomplish some really miraculous things in his life to, de- to deliver, using him as a general to deliver the nation of Israel from the Amalekites that had been invading them for, ten, I think, seven years in a row. And at the height of his victory, Gideon made a little bit of a choice that on the surface looked innocuous and innocent. He made an ephod. And he put it in a city. And we talked about this last week. We have our messages loaded on our website if you want to review that. But it says this little thing that Gideon made became a snare. All of the nation of Israel worshipped it as an idol. It became a snare to Gideon and to his whole house. His whole house. Last week, by way of review, for those of you that weren't here, we talked about the snares of Satan, how they're always seductive. Every snare of Satan has some bait. Something that attracts us, something that motivates us, something that we want. Otherwise, the snare would have no effect. I mean, who fishes with broccoli? All of Satan's snares are subtle, which means we don't usually recognize the snare. We recognize the bait easily enough, but we, we rationalize the choices we're making in order to obtain that snare without recognizing what we're doing. And then, of course, once, once we bit, it's very hard to get free. His, his snares are strong. Gideon was snared, and we, we talked about this a little bit last week, because of if you trace it deeply, he was snared, among other reasons, because there was a little bit of a resentment in his heart, a root of bitterness in his heart, that Satan was able to feed and fan until it literally consumed him and his family. Although Satan has an almost limitless bait shop, lots of different lures he can use, you can boil every one of them down to one of three categories. When we first meet Satan in Genesis chapter 3, he uses these three kinds of lures. They have different variations, but they all come into this. When we meet Satan 
tempting Jesus in the wilderness, he uses these three lures. And when we meet him face to face, he uses one of these three lures. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This morning, I'd like to talk to you about the pride of life and how, how subtly and, and effectively Satan is able to use that. Related to pride is bitterness. That's what took Gideon down. And bitterness is one of the most subtle and even seductive snares. Hebrews chapter 12, pick up reading with me. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is the chapter of faith. All the different people that made a difference whom God was able to work with. In verse, chapter 12, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, others have gone before us. They've made the difficult choices. And they cooperated with God. And God was able to do miraculous things to them that blessed them and blessed others through them. Therefore, because we have such a cloud of witnesses around us, let's run our race. It's our turn. Let's let God work through us. Let's put aside the weight and, uh, the, and the sins which easily beset us, the snares, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Then it talks about how God corrects us when we start to wander. Pick up reading with me in uh, verse 9. We have... Uh, Furthermore, we have had fathers after our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence or honor. Shall, not, we, not rather much, uh, shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they, that would be our human parents, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure or their own judgment. But he, that would be our heavenly Father God, he chastens us for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness, so that we might be able to experience God's grace in our lives and partner with God in accomplishing his purposes to spread that grace to others. Now, no chastening for the present. No spanking, no correction for the present seems joyous, but grievous. Who wants to get spanked? Who wants to be punished? Who wants to be corrected? Nobody. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness to who? To those who are exercised thereby. To those who learn the lessons of the chastisement. Because if they really learn the lessons, then they won't make that, those same mistakes in the future. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. Context here is God or others are punishing you or chastening you or treating you in a way that is unpleasant. And our natural tendency is to, to get discouraged, to get defeated. God says, pick up yourself and do the right thing, lest that which is turned out of the way, uh, let, let it be healed. Come back to God instead of drifting away from God. And make straight paths for your feet. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Remember, grace is what God is trying to do inside of you. And what God wants to do through you. So when we're hurt, when we're disappointed, when we're mistreated, when bad things happen to us, God is at work to try to accomplish his purposes. Remember Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. So when that happens to us, God gives us grace. But if we fail, if we reject that grace, if we wallow in our self-pity and allow bitterness to grow, a root of bitterness will spring up and one, it will trouble us. It will affect us. It will, it will contaminate our soil, the soil of our soul. And through us, instead of God working through us with his grace, Satan works through us to poison other people. That's what bitterness does. So why is it one of Satan's most effective snares? Well, first of all, almost always bitterness involves some kind of wound. Somebody hurts us. And wounds, Jesus himself said, are inevitable. Going back to physics, anything that moves produces friction. And when you have lots of things moving at the same time, they're going to bump into each other. Amos 4.4, 4, I think, says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but you, so most of you at some point in your life, you fell in love with somebody and, and somehow you tricked them into marrying you. And you thought you would walk together in bliss for the rest of your lives, yes? But you realize, hey, I'm walking with someone that's not exactly like me. Have you ever had any friction in your relationships? 
Jesus said, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. He doesn't say, hey, watch out because there's some mean people out there going to hurt you. He said, no, everybody out there is going to experience offenses. You have offended people. I have offended people. Jesus said, in this broken, fallen world, it's impossible to get through this world without pain, without offense. The word bitter that we shared in, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, it's pikria in the Greek language. It comes from a word, pikros, like run is the root word for running. You understand the idea when I say this word comes from this word. Pikria, bitterness, comes from pikros, which means to pierce or to cut. Somebody did something that cut you. Somebody hurt you emotionally. And it is inevitable. It's happened to every one of us at some point or another. Now, by the way, do all bumps and bruises, are they all intentional? No, but they all hurt, yes? The word offenses Jesus used in Luke 17, scandalon, where we get the word scandal from in the English language, by the way, it literally means to set a snare. Now, when you hurt someone, are you really set? Do you know consciously, I'm about to set a snare for you? We don't think like that, but Satan does. So every time there's a hurt, Satan sets a snare. That's exactly what these words mean. Jesus said, is it, imp it is impossible, but that offenses, snares, will be set in our lives. Wounds are not only inevitable, they are memorable. By that I mean they often leave scars. If you look closely at my face, you'll see a bunch of scars. Look closely at your body, probably somewhere along the line, you got cut. Maybe it was an accident, you did it to yourself. This scar I have in one of my eyes is a knife that someone threw at me. Uh, sometimes scars come because someone else did something to you. The word bitter, as we said, Picria comes from picros, which means point to pierce, but picros comes from a word pecnume, which means to set a tag, a peg, to set a tent, to immobilize something. The idea is when I'm cut, when I'm hurt, in my soul, I, 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 am, I, re, I react emotionally. And because I react emotionally, what happens is a stake is driven in my mind. Uh, it may not be a physical scar. But there's a bit of a scar in my soul that I remember. Emotion, usually negative emotion, acts as a hammer to nail that peg down, to press it deep into our mind. I sometimes tell people that when we're emotional, well, I was going to show a video. I'm not going to do it this week, but there's a, a cute little video I show about the brain, and there's two parts of the brain that react Dif very differently to, to circumstances. One is the amygdala. I call her Amy for short. And she's the one that protects us. She kicks in when we feel threatened. And, and it's the amygdala that, that sends a signal to, to release the adrenaline when we're upset or when we're afraid. The adrenaline does what for us? Fight or flight. Then there's the frontal lobe. I call that flow for short. The frontal lobe is the part of our brain that processes more rationally. We need both. God gave us both. The problem with Amy is all she senses is danger or pain. So she floods our brains with, with, with adrenaline, and that experience kind of gets nailed down in our heart. I use the example of like, instead of the next time you're in, in an argument with someone, write what you want to say down. Now, First of all, we don't usually think that way, right? We just erupt. That's Amy who erupts, by the way. Amy doesn't think. She acts. But picture this. I'm upset with my wife, or she's upset with me, and instead of letting Amy do it, we write all of what Amy wants to do on a piece of paper. But because Amy's got us upset, how hard am I pressing on that pencil? <laughs> now, I push that aside... I count to 3,542, and what happens to the adrenaline that's been pumping my body? It dissipates. 
Now I'm thinking, now Flo is thinking a little bit more rationally. And I go back to that paper that I was, all those hateful things I was going to say to that person. Do you think I would, do you think Flo would do some editing? What I'm trying to say with this memorable wounds is when Amy is involved, often we react externally and we cannot erase what we've said. It's done the damage. Sometimes we may not even say it, but the emotions have done what to our mind? They've written it down in big, bold, indelible ink. Go back to my little pad, and let's say I wanted to give that paper to my wife or my kids or whoever I'm upset with, but I want to erase some things. If I've written it with rage or emotion, how easy is it going to be to erase even the pencil that I've written down? That's what I'm talking about. That's what happens in our minds. When we're hurt, we react emotionally. Amy kicks in, adrenaline kicks in, and it scares. Forgive the expression, but it scars a part of our soul. So long after we've calmed down a little bit, the scars are still there. By the way, we don't remember often even the next day what we said or what they said or what, what happened. But what do we remember? We remember the scars. We remember the emotion. The devil knows this, and he plays it like a fiddle. So not only are wounds inevitable, and not only are wounds memorable, they leave scars, Wounds are vulnerable. When I am cut, what am I now vulnerable to? I'm going to bleed, but I'm also, the problem is not what comes out of me necessarily. It's what I'm now vulnerable to, infection. Notice this carefully, and I told you, Greek and Hebrew are very descriptive language. Picros not only means to pierce, it also means to poison. Anyone see or hear, read Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet? It wasn't the cut of the sword that killed Hamlet. It was a minor cut. It was the sword was poisoned. That's what killed Hamlet. Satan, emotion has a way of poisoning our words. The word literally means acid or caustic. The reality is bacteria kills more people in the world than bullets. This poison of bitterness, it spreads. It spreads into us. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, you're going to be troubled. You're going to be infected. But it doesn't stay with you. Once you're infected with bitterness, guess what's going to happen? Others are going to be defiled. The word defiled, meamno, contaminated. Bitterness can't stay by itself. It leaks out inevitably. And it puts other people around us at risk. The longer this wound, this hurt, this this, uh, experience stays open in our mind, just like the longer a wound stays open in my body, the greater the chance of something outside getting inside, some bacteria, some infection. The reality is 1 John 5, 19 says, "Little, little children, you are of God, but we know the whole world lieth in wickedness. So, What he's saying is, we're in a world that's full of evil. And when we are caught in this world that's full of bacteria, I mean, if you had an Ebola virus or bacteria, you're walking into a room. I used to be uh, in, in, uh, in the nuclear field, and one of my jobs was to train people how to work in contaminated environments, and you would not believe the hoops people have to jump through. But who wants to go home and infect their family? Who wants to go to work and work around a nuclear reactor that's got cobalt-60 or uranium or plutonium, and you want to do your job, and you want to blow your nose, and you want to rub your eye, and then you want to go home, and you want to touch your wife and, 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 and hug your kids and contaminate them. So part of my job for a number of years for General Dynamics was to teach people how to work in a contaminated environment. The problem is you can't see contamination. We're in a world that is contaminated. Everywhere you look, the devil's got his fingerprints somewhere. That's why Jesus called him the prince of this world and the God of this world. When we're wounded, don't you think that his host of demons are are ready to try to infect that wound? 
if the wound closes without being cleaned, what happens to it or what's the risk? You get some kind of infection anyway. You, you close the outside, but if the infection's already inside, what have you just done? You've trapped the infection. You put a Band-Aid over it. May I say as gently as I can, we're masters at this. We hurt each other. We don't really acknowledge the, the ugliness, but we recognize the symptoms. So what do we do? We put a band I'm sorry, get over it. And sometimes what do we do? Well, you know, we can't play the bitter game forever. We got to live with this person and we got to work with this person. So we do what? We get over it. By getting over it, I mean we close it. We're not bleeding all over everybody, but what happens to the infection? It grows inside. If we do not cleanse it with genuine forgiveness, the infection goes deeper and grows, and often we don't even know it's happening. It's often unseen. We're not even aware of it. So we, we saw how Satan uses it or why he uses bitterness. Now let's talk about how he uses bitterness. What is his end game? What is he trying to do? Well, ultimately what he's trying to do is gain dominion over us, to gain influence over our lives. In order to do that, he's got to move us away from God and away from God's protection. He's got to move us into his domain because once we start playing in the devil's backyard, guess what? All... All bets are off. Bitterness is a byproduct of pride. Proverbs 13, 10 says, only by pride comes contention, conflict. Pride is exactly what created Satan. He was Lucifer, one of the greatest archangels ever created. And Isaiah 40, 14 describes what happened. Pride was found in his heart, and he said, I will ascend to heaven. I will make my abode in the, in the mountains. I will be like the most high. But seven different eyes. I, it's me, I'm gonna do this. I don't care about God, I don't care what God, I'm gonna take over, and that's what made him Lucifer. Bitterness is also a twin of rebellion. The word rebellion in the Hebrew is mari. It comes from the word mara. Mara means bitter. So what is rebellion? When we think of rebellion, what do we think of? When we think of a rebellious child, what, do we th what, what, what does that mean? What does that connotation mean? Talk to me for a minute. He won't listen to who? To an authority. There's an authority in their lives that says, this is what you're supposed to do, and the child or sometimes the coworker, or sometimes the employee says, ain't happening. I don't have to listen. You're not the boss of me. Well, the reality is they often are the boss of them, but they still have that attitude that says, you can't make me, and they dig in their heels. We recognize that as a spirit of rebellion, and it's so common in our society that it no longer surprises us. Ever been to Walmart? See the kids with their wants and the fits that they pitch to embarrass mom or dad? How we respond to hurt or disappointment will determine whether we get better or whether we get bitter. Bitterness is the bacteria, so to speak, which produces rebellion. You see, rebellion comes from a word that means bitter. If, I'm not, if my pride is not affected, why do I have to rebel? But the fact that I'm pri proudful, and I don't think that person has the right to tell me what to do, or I, I think I know I mean, ask a teenager. They know everything. The, I, I've never had a bumper sticker on my car, but here's what I, I thought about when I saw it. So you're 15 years old and you have all the answers. Go ahead, run away. Live on your own. Prove to mom and dad you're right. <laughs> Bitter, or, uh, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 15, 23, this is God's perspective. We'll get to the backstory here in a moment. Rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. You get the idea why Satan's trying to get us into rebellion? Because 
in a way that you and I don't naturally think of, rebellion has the same influence in our lives as witchcraft. Webster's defines witchcraft as the use of sorcery or magic, communication with the devil, and irresistible influence or fascination. See, the devil is trying to get us where he can begin to influence us so that he can begin to frustrate what God is wanting to do in and through our lives. And so Satan, and God wants to use us as instruments of grace and peace and mercy. Satan wants us to use, use us as instruments of poison, to poison other people. In 1 Corinthians 10, 20, God describes witchcraft as fellowship with devils, kononos, where we get the word kononia, communion, literally partnership. Witchcraft, from God's perspective, is basically partnership with the devil we are cooperating with satan in his purposes and satan of course was the original rebel without a cause that verse rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and the very next part of the verse says and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry you've never known a stubborn person have you anybody that lived with you ever meet a stubborn person Notice how rebellion and stubbornness tie together. The word stubborn, stubborn, patsar, means to urge, to insist, my way, I'm not moving. Theme song of most Christians, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. And iniquity, avin, means to exert in vain, means we're pressing after our own will. And I, uh, thou will, the Bible says of Satan, thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till what? Iniquity, pride, self-will was found in thee. And idolatry is the Hebrew word teraphim. Teraphim is a family idol. Remember the story of Gideon? The first thing God told Gideon is tear down the family idol that your father had built. By the time Gideon's story ends, what did Gideon put in its place? a new family idol, a teraphim that the children of Israel worshipped. Now, under the reason what Satan is trying to do is through, through circumstances that rea- our pride reacts to, and if those are not quickly cleaned and corrected, a root of bitterness grows in us, and we begin to develop a defiant, stubborn, rebellious spirit. What is he trying to do? He's trying to influence us. So when we're or to the degree that we're under Satan's influence, and I'm not talking about possession. Though possession is an extreme form of satanic or devilish influence. What does the Bible say happens to the degree that we're under Satan's influence? We start opposing ourselves. We start making self-destructive decisions. Ever known anybody that did that? Ever see anybody like that in the mirror? Where you stop and say, why am I doing this? This is crazy. Why do I keep doing this? Because you're caught in the devil's snare. I cannot urge this enough. That verse closes. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, lest peradventure God will give them repentance, we'll talk about that in a moment, to the acknowledging of the truth, so they can recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. What does at his will mean? It means you are trapped. It means Satan's got you in a headlock. I don't know if you've ever felt helpless. But if you ever have, it's a terrible feeling, isn't it? Have you ever been completely at the mercy of someone else? Anthony's a wrestler. Good wrestler, I understand. In wrestling, there's a referee there. And the referee, if you get this guy pinned for what? A count of three, is that right? Anthony, a long time since I wrestled. Count of three. Then what happens to this headlock or this painful position that you're contorted in because the other guy's got you? He lets go. But let me tell you what, there is no referee when we're wandering in the devil's background, in his playground. He has us, he's hurting us, and we are completely, to the degree that we're allowing him, as long as we're rationalizing we're in his snare. Remember, how many of you remember what happened to Korean Flight 007? Remember what happened, oh, it's 25 years ago. 
uh, 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 I think it was an American Airlines, I can't remember, but they were flying from some, Korea somewhere, a lot of Americans on it, there was a missionary and his family, there was an politi- American politician, a congressman I believe, there was a playboy, I mean there were lots of American people, it wasn't full of Americans, lots of American people, it drifted into Soviet airspace in the middle of the Cold War, so what did the Russians do? Blew it out of the air, and there was a lot of papers and ugly articles, but guess what happened to the Russians? Nothing. They said, you invaded our airspace. I think of that when we go into the devil's territory, he can shoot us down. Why is he called the accuser of the brethren? Because when we drift in his territory, he goes up to heaven and says, God, you've got to give him to me. He's mine. She's mine. Now, Satan's always on a leash, by the way, but I don't want a Doberman in my living room. I want to illustrate how, this, how Satan accomplished this with King Saul, the first king of Israel. I'm going to run through this very quickly. That's why I give you notes. I encourage you to follow up on it. King Saul was full of hope and promise as a young man. The Bible describes him as a choice young man and goodly. There was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than him. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. He was big. Initially, he was humble. But eventually, once he became the king... Within a couple of years, I think three years as a king, there was a battle. It was against the Philistines, and and Samuel said, wait here for seven days. I will come, and I will intercede, and I will make an offering for you before the Lord, before you go to battle. The seventh day came, and Saul was anxious because the people were nervous, and they started to leave him. And Saul said, bring the ox here. I'll make the sacrifice. Then Samuel showed up and said, what have you done? And he began to, I forced myself, you weren't here. I had to do it. You see the beginning of the rationalization? He was the king, but he became, he took upon him to become the priest. Instead of using his role and letting others do what God had called them to do, he said, I don't need him, I'll do it myself because I forced myself. During that battle, the next day, The people of Israel were all scattered. Samuel reacted and said, you know, you did stupidly, you did foolishly. The kingdom is not going to be established in your hand because of this this pride that you have. The next day, Jonathan and his armor bearer go up to battle a Philistine garrison. I think there's an incredible number of men that he defeated, two men against a whole garrison. And when the people of Israel saw what was going on and the Philistines were now fleeing, they got out of their little stupor and they started fighting. And the Philistines started fleeing, and and Saul, basically, as the men were leaving, they'd been hungry, they hadn't eaten in a couple of days, The, the men of Israel were distressed because Saul had ordered the people, cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening. They hadn't eaten the day before, they're in the middle of a battle, and so, but notice what motivated, that I may be avenged on my enemies. Saul is the king, they're winning, they're coming to the camp, the camp has got plenty of food, the men are... They're not starving, but they're hungry and they're weak. They want to eat. And Saul said, you eat, you die. If you eat, you die. But you see, Jonathan, his son, was in the other area fighting the battles, and he didn't hear that. Ignorant of the vow, he had some honey. And then when Saul found out, he said, Jonathan, God do so and more also, for you're going to die. You get the idea? This egomaniac makes a ridiculous decision. Have we ever done that, guys? Have we ever made a a stupid decision? And when someone appealed to us that it was a stupid decision, what do we do? We dig in. Because I said so. Does this sound a little bit like stubbornness? The next chapter, God appears to him. I remember what Amalek did to Israel, how he laid in wait in the way, came up when they came up from Egypt. God made a promise to Joshua as the children of Israel were leaving because the Amalekites came in and attacked the back the, the, the stragglers and killed them. And there was a battle between, remember when Moses lifted up the rod and Aaron and Hur? That was the battle with the Amalekites. And God made a promise that I will utterly destroy the remembrance of Amalek. Fast forward the clock about 150 years. Who was it that was attacking Israel when Gideon was there? It was the Amalekites. Now this is about 300 years later. Now Saul is the king and God says, I have given them 400 years 
to change. So now I want you to go and fulfill the promise I made to Joshua. Destroy them. Destroy everything. Now I'm not here to justify or rationalize God. I'm telling you this is what happened. I don't have the back. You can read the back story. But Saul spared Agag and the best of the sheep and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. Then when Samuel showed up, he, re- he didn't even recognize that he had done wrong. First thing he said, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. I did what you sent me to do. I defeated the Amalekites. Then when Samuel confronted him, what meaneth then the bleeding of the sheep in my ear? He began to rationalize. Well, we saved the best to sacrifice to the Lord. That's not why they did it. They, they flew on the spoil. They saved it for themselves. But now they're, con- now they're confronted and they got to come up with a story. Remember that old classic hymn of the faith? That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Well, he changed his story. And when confronted again, he redirected the blame. Well, the people spared the sheep. Who was the boss here? The people spared the sheep and a little bit of honesty took the spoil. You get the idea how this, his rationalizations are being peeled back like the layers of an onion. This is the story where Samuel said, hath the Lord great delight as sacrifice and as, as in obeying the voice of the Lord for rebellion. That's what this was. That's exactly that. Samuel looked right in his heart and said, you have a rebellious spirit. Rebellion is a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. Thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, so the Lord has rejected thee from being king. When he heard that, notice Saul's reaction. It's a long story. I, I encourage you to read it. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Remember the band-aid I told you about? Okay, you're right. I'm wrong. Let's get over it. Let's move on. Got things to do, places to go, people to impress. I sin, but notice what he said yet. Yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people. What's he really looking for? He's looking for Samuel, the spiritual head, to pretend like everything's okay. Don't embarrass me. These people think I'm the king. (laughs) Treat me like the king. Well, who made him the king? God through Samuel, made him the king. But Samuel had already told him, the Lord has rejected you from being king. Well, I don't care what God wants. I want your approval. Have you ever been around a rebel who was insisting on doing the wrong thing, but he still wants your approval? He wants you to say what you're doing is okay. It'll be all right. Let me tell you what, honey. It's not going to be all right when you rebel against God. That story will never end well. Then, naturally enough, Saul became depressed. The next chapter, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit began to trouble him. It's interesting. I took it out because I don't know. I don't have the time to do it. But it says an evil spirit from the Lord. Does the Lord have a you know a, a bass section in the angelic choir called evil spirits? No, he doesn't. The evil spirits are the demons that come from Satan. But God allowed an evil spirit to begin to attack Saul. Why? Because Saul was in Satan's territory. God didn't say, okay, I can't wait for this. No, Satan is the accuser. Satan came to God. And by the way, Satan was fueling this pride in Saul anyway. This is exactly what Satan wanted to happen, and he was playing Saul like a fiddle. So the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God left Saul and an evil spirit began to afflict him. That's when David got involved because David was a musician. And I, man, there's so, so much I need to say here, but let me just say, say this. Music can be used from God or it can be used by Satan. David's skill helped calm him. Then the next chapter, there's another battle, 40 days, 40 nights. Saul's not willing to fight Goliath. No one's willing to fight Goliath. David shows up and fights Goliath. There's a great victory. And on the way home, the women greeted the army, and the women played and sang and danced with timbrels. And notice what they said. Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. How do you think Saul reacted to that? Not well. Saul was very wroth. And he said, uh, it displeased him. They've ascribed to David 10,000. To me, they've only ascribed thousands. Boo-hoo. Call the ambulance, you know. But he had this little pity party. 
What can he have more but the kingdom? You understand what's going on? Now he's becoming jealous. So what does he do? On multiple occasions, he tried to kill David. An evil spirit came upon Saul. David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand, and javelin. Saul cast the javelin. He said, I will kill David. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Twice, Saul tried to run him through with a javelin. David runs away. David stops at the priest of Nob, the high priest, and he gets Goliath's sword. That's another very interesting story for another time. And he's running. The priest doesn't know what's going on. David lied to the priest. David, made it, David fell into the, the snare of the devil too. To protect himself, he rationalized lying to the priest. The, uh, Saul finds out that, that the priest of Nob helped David. So Saul confronts them. And Saul turns to Doag and says, turn and kill the priests. The city of the priest. He fell upon the priest and, and killed 85 innocent men. This is the king. He ordered the death of 85 innocent men, but he wasn't content. Remember what I told you about when Amy's in charge? How adrenaline floods your mind and you make really, really, really bad decisions. Not only did he kill the priest, he smote the women and the children. He just wiped out the city. Why do you think he did that? Certainly there was a rage there, but what do you think was a subtle motive? If I let someone live, word's going to get out of what I'm doing. So he rationalized the innocent, of a, uh, the innocent murder of, of a whole bunch of people. Then David was married to his own daughter, Michael. And so he takes Michael, David's wife, and forces her to marry another man. Then he repeatedly lies and ruthlessly hunts David for the next number of years. Finally, he's so tired of ha- this living like this, he goes to a witch and says, what's going to happen? I'm afraid the Lord's departed from me. What am I going to do? And he begins to consult a witch. The battle turns south, and in despair, 1 Samuel 31, he takes his own life. Now, here's the point of this story. All along this process where he is, Satan is tugging his chain, and he is going further and further and further into Satan's territory, rationalizing every evil act along the way, he had many opportunities to repent. Twice David spared his life. And said, I could have killed you. The things that you, I'm, I'm not trying to take your kingdom. I refuse to kill you. Twice that happened. And Saul put a band-aid on. I'm sorry, David. And then slipped right back into the bitter, hateful snare of the devil. So how do we reverse the curse? I know I'm going to have to be very quick here. In James chapter 1, it says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Where do these problems really come from? Where do we think they come from? Well, from my husband, of course. From my wife. From my boss. Isn't that what we think? We rationalize. If they would just do what I want them to do, I'd be a perfect wife, a perfect husband, a perfect son, a perfect father. I'd be the ideal employee if they just do what I want them to do. We don't see the prideful, rebellious spirit That motivates that. James says, where do these wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your own lusts, which war in your members. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have. Ye fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. And even when you ask God, you're asking that you may consume it upon your own lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses. What James is saying is he's peeling back our justifications and saying, take a good look inside. That's where the problem is. So we recognize our responsibility. We take a good, honest look at ourselves, and we see ourselves the way God sees us, and we go to God and say, God, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. We get our eyes off of the moat in our brothers or our sisters or our husbands and our wives or our pastor or our boss. We get our eyes off of the moat in their eyes, and they're always moats. And we look at the beam. That's what Jesus said. Confess your sin. Then we respond to God. Verse 7 says, submit yourselves to God. 
the whole point is God is trying to pour his grace on you. He's trying to do a work in your heart. If you will cooperate with God, if you will confess your sins, if you will look to God, God will begin to take care of these snares in your life. So submit yourselves to God. Hupotasso, subordinate to God. You're a rebel. You want God and everybody else to subordinate to you. Recognize the rebellion and then get under God's authority and the authority of those God has placed over you. Basically cooperate with God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, Proverbs 3 says. Lean not to your own understanding. Why? Because our own understanding is all messed up. Because Satan has laid too many snares for us and they've been covered with honey and, and leaves and we can't see them. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. And then resist the devil and he will flee from you. Isn't it ironic? We usually submit to the devil and resist God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. The word resist, um, it, it, it's the Greek word from where we get the word antihistamine. We fight back. We contest or challenge Satan's claims on us. I'm not going to follow you anymore. I'm tired of following you. I'm gonna, I belong to the Lord. I'm going to give myself to him. Ephesians chapter 6 talks about arming yourself with the weapons to do that. Then reconnect to God. The next part of the verse says, draw nigh to God. He will draw near to you. Commit yourselves to the Lord. Get under his authority, under his protection. Verse 8 through 10 says, repent. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Remember, last week we talked about 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 2. In a great house, there's vessels of honor and vessels of not honor. In everybody's life, there's good things, there's things that are not very good. If a man would, or a woman would purge or clean himself of the things that are dishonorable, they will be a vessel in honor. So clean your life. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Notice this. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. What is that about? What is that about? It's about stop putting band-aids over cancer. It means dig deep to the real issues. Get a broken heart. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then he had her husband murdered, David put a Band-Aid over it for about a year. And so Nathan confronted David. I don't have time to talk about how he did that, but in a way that David finally saw. And then David was broken. And you can read Psalm 51, what David prayed. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For against thee have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Thou dost not, desirest not a sacrifice, else I would give it. David says, I can't just buy a bull and pay the priest to sacrifice on my behalf because my sin was presumptuous. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. It took David about a year before he realized, you know, I did the same thing Saul did. In fact, David did worse than Saul ever did. He said, I'm becoming Saul. God help me. That's who I'm becoming. And when he saw it, it broke his heart. So he took that broken heart to God and God put it back together and he'll do it for you too. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. The snare of the devil. If God will give us repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they might recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Offenses are impossible to avoid. Everybody in this room has been wounded. I'm going to make a general statement. I hope you don't hold me to task for it. And I may be wrong. But it is likely that everybody in this room is bitter about something. Somebody hurt you. They never really acknowledged it. They never owned it. And that wound has left a scar. And every time you see that scar or feel that scar, or any time you remember that or something that's like that, you have to deal with Amy kicking in and that emotion again. You may not have enough bitterness in you to kill you, but it keeps you sick. And it's something the devil is able to use to snare you the next time around. 
I want to challenge you to go home, read James chapter 4, take your notes, do yourself a favor, take your notes and look to the great physician. And he said, would you clean? Would you clean my heart? Would you give me your grace? What did Jesus say? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Somebody owes you. Somebody owes you. And you know exactly who it is. Pull the band-aid off. Bring it to God. The great physician. And do what David did in Psalm 51. And then again, Psalm 139, search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Anything in this heart, any root of bitterness, any wound that's never healed, anything Satan can use to snare me. Do you think Saul, when he was anointed king as a young man, had any idea that he would ever become the murderer of an entire village of priests and their wives and children? The reality is once Satan has us hooked, he just pulls us where he wants us. And at some point, we may wiggle around and try to get free, but what we really need is the Lord. What did Peter do when he started to sink in the Sea of Galilee? 600 feet deep, by the way, that sea is. What did he do? Lord, save me. And what did Jesus do? Nope. You got to learn this lesson, buddy. I'll see you in eternity. No. Jesus grabbed him. But what did Jesus say? Oh, ye of little faith. Learn the lessons. Because if you don't learn the lessons, you'll repeat the process. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that you see us as we are. You see right through us. David said, there's not a word in my mouth, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. We spent a lot of time recently talking about God's library and all of the books and all of the records that you're keeping on us. So there's nothing we can hide from you. But Lord, there's a lot we hide from ourselves and there's a lot we hide from each other. Our hearts are deceitful. And that's why Satan is so often able to get us to deceive ourselves so that we're so aware of everybody else's faults, but we're not very conscious of what we've done to hurt others or how we react to when others have hurt us. God, this is a problem in most of our lives in every one of our lives at some time and to some degree. So I pray that your Holy Spirit would do what I cannot, that you would search our hearts. And Lord, that you would put your finger right on those scars that are infected still. And Lord, regardless of who did it or how it happened, that you would pour the ointment of your grace on our hearts. Draw that infection out. Help us to do what you tell us to do in James 5, to stop focusing on how others have hurt us and to recognize how we have hurt others. That we might be cleansed, that we might draw near to you, that we might allow you to lift us up and that we might stop partnering with the devil in the many and subtle ways in which he seeks to pull us away from you and to use us to pull others away. We ask in Jesus' name.